Hello, I am Professor Sims, and in this video, I will discuss genes, gene expression, and genomics. This is lesson seven as part of the 10 lessons held as part of my Gen Bio 1 course. If your student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include describing the structural structure of nucleotides, nitrogenous bases, and DNA. We'll explain PCR, DNA sequencing. We'll talk about different types of DNA mutations and repair mechanisms. I'll explain DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation, aka the central dogma. We'll talk about the genetic code, how nucleic sequences prescribe amino acid and protein sequences. We'll talk about how gene regulation regulation occurs and how changes in gene expression disrupt the cell cycle and can even cause cancer. Finally, we'll discuss genomics, pharmacogenomics, proteomics, and other types of biotechnologies used in medicine, research, and agriculture. So DNA is made up of nucleotides, and a nucleotide is made up of parts too, so we're going to talk about those. Um, a nucleotide consists of a nitrogenous base, a 5-carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. The nitrogenous base can be any of, be either a purine, such as adenine and guanine, or a pyrimidine, such as cytosine and thymine. Purines are the ones that have the double ring structure, and pyrimidines only have one ring. This sugar that is in DNA is called deoxyribose. That's how it gets its name, deoxyribonucleic acid. The sugar that is in RNA, it's called ribose, which is why RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. The nucleotides are all linked together by phosphodiester bonds, uh, where the phosphate of one nucleotide is attached to the sugar of the next nucleotide. And this creates a chain with a 5' prime phosphate and a free 3' prime OHN. Here's what that looks like here. This is the 5 carbon sugar and the phosphate group attached to it and then those attached to attached to either one of these permidines or a purine and all of those parts attached to each other is what is called a nucleotide in the 1950s francis crick and james watson collaborated to determine the structure of dna they were inspired by the work of scientists like linus pauling and maurice wilkins who were also investigating the dna structure they ended up utilizing x-ray diffraction pattern that was discovered by Rosalind Franklin. She had um, been working in an x-ray diffraction lab and she had lots of data and was actually able to photograph the double helix. And Watson and Crick were obviously inspired by that work, and they combined their expertise in x-ray diffraction analysis, and they proposed that DNA is indeed a double helix consisting of two intertwined strands. So up until that point, some people thought that it was just one strand. Some people thought that there was a, like a triple helix thing happening, but now it was confirmed that it is a double helix. Well, the two strands are anti-parallel, and then the sugar phosphate backbones form the outer structure, while the nitrogenous bases stack inward like rungs on a ladder. And then the uniform diameter of the helix, so the width of the helix, stays the same, and that's because of the complementary base pairing, the A to T, C to G. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. This is figure 14.7, and it's got the double helix structure here on the left. B here is um, a close-up showing the phosphate diester bonds, the hydrogen bonds in the middle, phosphodiester bonds on the outside. And notice that it's only purine and pyrimidine, purine and pyrimidine. And that's how it stays the same width in the middle. And that's why they only bind to those bases and to no other bases. A only goes with T and C only goes with G. And then C over here is showing the major and minor groove. The grooves work as binding sites for DNA binding proteins that work during transcription and replication. Each strand is a polynucleotide, meaning the strand is made up of many individual units called nucleotides. A nucleotide has three components, the five carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and one of four possible nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. The nitrogenous base is always attached at the one prime carbon of the sugar, 
If we count from there, we can see that there is a phosphate between the 5' prime carbon of one sugar and the 3' prime carbon of the neighboring sugar. The sugar is called deoxyribose because it is missing a hydroxyl group at the 2' prime carbon, which is present in ribose. Because of this, nucleotides in DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, are called deoxynucleotides. Nucleotides attach to each other in the DNA strand by phosphodiester bonds. The phosphate group of one nucleotide binds to the 3' prime oxygen of the neighboring nucleotide. Thus, we can see that the sugars and phosphate groups make up the DNA backbone. The carbon numbering is key to describing the directionality of the DNA strand, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Looking within the sugars, there is an intrinsic orientation difference between the two strands. On the top strand, you can see that the 5' prime carbon of each sugar is on the left, and the 3' prime carbon is on the right. The opposite is true for the bottom strand. Reading left to right, that makes the top strand orientation 5' prime to 3', prime, and the bottom strand orientation 3' prime to 5'. Prime. These strands are also sometimes called Watson and Crick. Keep in mind that this double-stranded DNA is still a double helix, and we have simplified the representation by flattening and unwinding the helix here to better see the atomic structure. Although the nucleotides come together through covalent bonds in the backbone, the two DNA strands interact through non-covalent hydrogen bonds between the bases. Each base forms multiple hydrogen bonds with its complementary base on the opposite strand. Bound together by hydrogen bonds, each unit is called a base pair. The hydrogen bonding contributes to the specificity of base pairing. Thymine preferentially pairs with adenine through two hydrogen bonds, and cytosine preferentially pairs with guanine through three hydrogen bonds. Thymine and cytosine are called pyrimidines, characterized by their single ring structure, and adenine and guanine are called purines, which have double rings. The geometry of the AT, or TA, and GC, or CG, base pairs is the same, allowing for symmetry and base stacking in the helix. This mostly has to do with the distance between the backbones and the angles to which the base is attached to the backbone. Other base pairs, like GT for example, do not have the same geometry, cannot form strong hydrogen bonds, and disturb the helix. The double helix structure of DNA is highly regular. Each turn of the helix measures approximately 10 base pairs. DNA sequencing was a really lengthy and expensive process up until the 1990s. Around that time, advancements in technology and automation made it safer, cheaper, and faster to sequence DNA. Fred Sanger is the creator of the dideoxy chain termination method, and we usually just call that Sanger sequencing. The method involves using dideoxynucleotides, DDNTPs, in addition to the regular free deoxynucleotides, the DNTPs. You use the dideoxynucleotides that have a 3' prime OH group that's missing, and you use those as chain terminators. So by adding a specific ratio of the dideoxynucleotides to the regular nucleotides, you have different sized DNA fragments that are generated. The DNA sample is denatured, it's divided into separate tubes with primers and nucleotides, and DDNTPs are added to each tube, and then each dideoxynucleotide has a fluorescently labeled tag. So it's got a fluorescent label for detection and you have chain elongation stopping once the fluorescent tag is incorporated and results in fragments that are separated by electrophoresis and a laser scanner comes and reads the sequence by detecting the fluorescent marker. Uh, in gel electrophoresis is a technique that's used for separating DNA fragments by their size and by their charge. What you have is a gel that's made out of agarose. You have, um, agarose is a polysaccharide polymer that came, it comes from seaweed. It's a solidifying agent. So you mix the agarose powder with a buffer, you heat it up, you pour the gel solution into a casting tray, and you allow that to cool and solidify. And once it's solid, you take the DNA samples and you put them into little wells that have been cut out of the gel. And since DNA has a negative charge, if you put an electric current across the gel and you put 
the positive charge at the opposite side of the gel. The DNA wants to migrate through the gel to the positive end, and it separates the DNA based on the fragment sizes. So the smaller fragments go a lot further, a lot faster than the larger fragments because they're physically moving through a semi-solid gel. So the smallest fragments end up the furthest away from where they started, and after separation, the gel is stained with a DNA-specific dye so that you can see it. You can visibly see the DNA in the gel. So figure 14.8 is talking about Sanger sequencing. This can be kind of confusing, but um, if you understand how PCR works, you understand how sequencing works. Okay, it's very similar. What you have is you have a reaction mixture that has your DNA, and it's got the enzymes in there to make the reaction go, and then it has the free nucleotides, your adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. You add them in there, and in the PCR, what you're doing is you're amplifying the DNA. You run it through hot and cold cycles, and the DNA denatures, and then it elongates, it replicates. The same thing is happening in Sanger sequencing, except in addition to everything you would use for PCR, you also have these little things that are altered artificially. They've had the 3 prime OH group removed. So when that OH group is gone, the next nucleotide that wants to add to the growing DNA chain, it can't because it doesn't have that little OH group to hook onto. So if you have these dideoxynucleotides in your reaction mixture, they are going to randomly bind to DNA that's replicating. And when they do, it's going to stop the replication because there's nothing, it doesn't have that OH group to hook onto. So it stops the reaction. And then if you put in place of that OH, a fluorescent molecule, it works as a little flag, like a little tag that says, hi, here I am. And in that way, you can actually see the position. If you have dideoxy, the adenine, guanine, they have color coding. So once you run it through the gel, you can see an image that the laser has put out and it tells you what color it saw, it tells you what position it saw that color, and the peaks tell you how confident it is. So, like, there is some background noise down here, but these are very big peaks, so you know that this is good data. This is definitely a G. This is definitely a G. So that's how Singer sequencing works. And then this is the gel electrophoresis, what it looks like. So you put it in these wells, you put the DNA in these wells, and then after this is loaded, she put a cover on it and turn on um, a power source that runs a electricity through the gel. And then after it's done running and you stain the gel, you can put this under a light and see the DNA that's been separated by size. Histones are conserved proteins that are rich in amino acids, and they combine to make nucleosomes. The nucleosomes kind of look like a bead on a string, and it has the DNA tightly wrapped around it. And then it becomes connected to adjacent nucleosomes by linker DNA. And then here comes another histone that makes this fiber around the chromatin. During metaphase, the chromosomes get even more condensed with the aid of scaffolding folding proteins. And at this point, it's about 700 nanometers in width. During interphase, the eukaryotic chromosomes exhibit two distinct regions. One is heterochromatin and one is euchromatin. Heterochromatin is densely packed and it contains non-expressed genes. It's found near the centromere and the telomere. So we're talking here and out here. The euchromatin is less dense, but it contains actively transcribed genes and it's packaged around the nucleosomes, but it's not as tightly compacted. The discovery of the DNA helix structure actually hinted at the mechanism of DNA replication. Watson and Crick wrote this groundbreaking paper in 1953 suggesting that the specific base pairing in DNA allows for accurate copying of genetic material. According to their model, the two strains of the double helix separate during replication and each strand serves as a template for the synthesis of a new strand. However, the precise details details of how this would work were unclear at the time, and they had three proposed models. One was conservative, the other was semi-conservative, and the last one was dispersive. The conservative model suggests that parental DNA remains intact, while the semi-conservative model proposed 
proposes that each parental DNA strand acts as a template, resulting in one old and one new strand in each of the newly formed DNA. The dispersive model suggested that both copies of DNA have segments of parental and newly synthesized DNA interspersed. Here's an illustration of the three models that had been proposed, conservative, semi-conservative, and dispersive. You may already know which of these models ended up being correct, but we will go into that in a moment. During DNA replication, each of the two strands that make up the double helix serves as a template from which new strands are copied. The new strands will be complementary to the parent strands, and when two daughter DNA copies are formed, they have the same sequence and they are divided equally into daughter cells. When DNA replicates, the double helix unwinds, and then each strand serves as a template for the synthesis of a new complementary strand. This ensures that the daughter DNA have the same sequence, they're distributed equally. In prokaryotes like E. coli, DNA replication occurs rapidly and with high accuracy. We should go ahead and introduce the key enzymes in prokaryotic DNA replication. Um, as these enzymes play a crucial role in adding new nucleotides to the growing DNA strand, nucleoside triphosphates provide both the nucleotides and the energy that's needed for polymerization. Figure 1440 is showing some of what we saw in the video. This is topoisomerase that keeps the DNA from recoiling. The helicase opens up the DNA, separates the strands. We have single strand binding proteins that help keep the strands separate, separated. And then we have primase that's making the RNA primer. DNA replication is a pretty precise and accurate process, but errors can occur, like when DNA polymerase inserts the wrong base, for example. Mistakes like that happen all the time and they can have serious consequences including what we were just talking about cancer um, mutations can also arise from dna damage either induced or spontaneous induced mutations result from exposure to chemicals or environmental agents spontaneous mutations occur naturally within the body mutations can affect a single base pair resulting in substitution or silent mutations some mutations replace one amino acid with another impacting protein function. Others generate stop codons. Stop codons terminate protein synthesis, and a mutation could be causing that to stop too early, right? Uh, trinucleotide repeat expansions lead to repeated regions of the same amino acid, and, and you have insertions and deletions and translocations. They're all different types of mutations. We'll talk about them some more in a minute. Mutations in repair genes have been linked to various forms of cancer. Somatic cell mutations cause uncontrolled cell division, while germ cell mutations are passed on to the next generation. So examples of that are hemophilia and xeroderma pigmenosa. Repair mechanisms exist to fix these errors, but sometimes mistakes go uncorrected. And like we were saying, repair enzymes themselves can be defected or mutated. So figure 1419 is showing a mutation that is caused by exposure to UV light. So basically you have thymines that are forming dimers. Um, and in a normal cell, these would normally be excised by nuclease and then replaced by DNA polymerase. So these are some of your repair mechanisms. And it's done by these enzymes, nuclease, DNA polymerase, and then ligase, of course, fills in the gap. Then this is how DNA uh, mutations can lead to changes in the protein sequence. So we're going to talk more about proteins later in the semester, but essentially proteins are just long chains of amino acids. And then the amino acids are encoded for in the DNA. So it's a three base pair codon that encodes for specific amino acids to be put in a specific sequence, right? If you have a mutation that is just removing or it's just adding something, but it's not changing the code, right? So this amino acid can be encoded by this codon, but also by this one. So, you know, no harm, no foul. You just have one base pair that was changed, but it didn't change the code. So that is a silent mutation. A missense mutation, there's a change in the code and there is a consequence because CCC and ACC encode for different amino acids. 
nonsense substitutes a stop codon. So this THG, this is a codon that is telling the replication mechanisms, okay, this is where we stop. So we're not, we're not making more DNA. We're not making more proteins. We're not making any more amino acids. So this, a nonsense point mutation can be a very big problem. And then frame shift mutations, these also can lead to severe issues because you have either an insertion or a deletion that shifts the whole reading frame entirely. So here the T and the A get deleted and it changes every amino acid after that because the entire reading frame has been shifted over by two spots. And now a codon only has three base pairs. So if you've shifted it over two base pairs, you've really kind of changed the entire order of the codons. And so you end up with completely different amino acids being formed and completely different proteins. Now, as we saw a, a minute ago with the thymer, thymine, thymine dimers, DNA polymerase does do some proofreading. Um, it reads the newly added base pairs before adding the next one. And if the base is correct, the polymerase continues. But if it's not, the enzyme, the polymerase will cut the phosphodiester bond and remove that nucleotide. And it does this using this enzyme called exonuclease. And then if this doesn't do it, if this doesn't fix the problem, there is another method. It's called mismatch repair. So usually you have repair enzymes that are recognizing and removing mismatch nucleotide. And figure 1417 is showing how the DNA polymerase can break this phosphodiester bond and remove this base pair and replace it with the correct one. In mismatch repair, if there's an incorrectly added base and it's detected after replication is done, the mismatch repair proteins can detect the base and remove it from the newly synthesized strand, again with a nuclease. And then the gap is filled with DNA ligase, just like we saw before. Um, I want to show you a video of how this works. Again, it's really kind of difficult to visualize it and try to remember all the enzyme names and stuff. So. DNA mismatches occur during DNA replication. For simplicity, this animation will show DNA as a flat molecule. Before replication can begin, a helicase needs to unwind the DNA molecule. In E. coli, DNA polymerase 3 catalyzes the incorporation of new complementary bases to the new DNA strand. This is only the alpha and beta units of the DNA polymerase 3 enzyme. However, it is possible for DNA polymerase 3 to incorporate a non-complementary base to the new strand. This is known as a mismatch. A mismatch could result in a faulty protein being coded for, so it needs to be repaired. The first step in the mismatch repair pathway in E. coli is recognition of the mismatch by the mute S homodimer. Mute S recognizes the mismatch and binds to it. Then the mute L homodimer binds to mute S ready for a later step in the mismatch repair pathway. Meanwhile, up to a kilobase away, the MUTH protein recognizes a GATC site. MUTH is a weak endonuclease, which will create a backbone incision between the guanine and adenine residues on the newly synthesized strand when activated. MUTH is able to differentiate between the newly synthesized strand and the template strand by the lack of methylation markers on the newly synthesized strand. This is why the pathway is also known as methyl-directed mismatch repair. In order for mutate to become activated, it needs to bind with mutel. This causes the DNA to bend. The newly formed backbone incision allows an exonuclease to enter and begin excising nucleotides from the newly synthesized strand. The exonuclease excises the mismatched nucleotide and stops excising just beyond it. Now, DNA polymerase 3 can begin to resynthesize the new strand, inserting the correct complementary base where the mismatch used to be. The final step is for DNA ligase to ligate the backbone nick. The mismatch pathway is now completed 
and all the newly synthesized DNA is complementary to the template strand. Since Mendel's work was rediscovered in 1900, our understanding of genes has evolved significantly. Genes are no longer an abstract concept. They are actually tangible molecules that are made of DNA. They're organized linearly on chromosomes and they carry instructions for building proteins, which are crucial for cell functions and for life itself. At this point, we've heard quite a bit already about how DNA contains the genetic code, but more specifically, the genetic code refers to the DNA alphabet and the RNA alphabet and the polypeptide alphabet. So that's the sequence of amino acids. The genetic code comes to exist via the central dogma. We talked about the central dogma in the intro to genetics lecture. It consists of three steps, DNA replication, transcription, and translation. We discussed DNA replication in lesson four, and today we're going to talk a lot more about translation transcription and translation. Very briefly, transcription is the process of creating messenger RNA copies of genes. These mobile copies contain an alphabet of A, C, G, or U, and the mRNA is then translated onto on ribosomes, converting the nucleotide-based information into proteins. This process of DNA protein synthesis, it follows a systematic flow of genetic information. So, Figure 15.3 shows these steps in another way. The DNA code has the instructions, right, which gets transcribed into messenger RNA. Ribosomes read the code from the mRNA and use it to make amino acids, which later fold to make proteins. There are thousands of proteins in the human body, and they're all made up from just 20 amino acids. These 20 amino acids are encoded for by 64 triplet codons. What we have is 64 four groups of mRNA letters that are making the code for 20 amino acids. The use of multiple codons to represent the same amino acid is known as degeneracy. This redundance helps to buffer against the impact of random mutation. Codons for the same amino acid usually differ by only one nucleotide, and codons for chemically similar amino acids tend to share similarities. For example, aspartate and glutamate both fall in the GA block and have negative charges. So this aspect of the genetic code helps to ensure that a single nucleotide mutation might still specify the same or a very similar amino acid, and this prevents the protein from becoming totally non-functional. The genetic code is almost universal with only a few exceptions. Nearly all organisms rely on the same genetic code for protein synthesis, and this widespread use of the code strongly suggests a common origin for all life on Earth. It's quite remarkable, considering the vast number of possible combinations between 20 amino acids and 64 codons. The Crick-Brenner et al. experiment was a scientific experiment performed by Francis Crick, Sidney Brenner, Leslie Barnett, and R.J. Watts Tobin. It was a key experiment in the development of what is now known as molecular biology, and it led to a publication entitled The General Nature of the Genetic Code for Proteins. The study study demonstrated that the genetic code is made up of a series of three base pair codons, which code for individual amino acids. The experiment also elucidated the nature of gene expression and frame shift mutation. In the experiment, proflavin-induced mutations of the T4 bacteriophage gene were isolated. Proflavin causes mutations by inserting itself between DNA bases, resulting in an insertion or a deletion of a base pair. Through the use of proflavin, the experimenters were able to insert or delete base pairs into their sequence of interest, and when nucleotides were inserted or deleted, the gene would often be non-functional. However, if three base pairs were added or deleted, the gene would remain functional, and this proved that the genetic code uses a codon of three nucleotide bases that correspond to an amino acid. So this is figure 15-2, and it's showing the structures of all 20 amino acids. I don't want you to worry. You don't have to memorize these. I just wanted you to see that they all have the same amino group here and an acidic carboxyl group, and then a different, they all have a different organic R group, or this, this side chain is what changes between the 20 different amino acids. Figure 15.4 is 
showing uh, the arrangement of codons in the coding table, which reveals the structure of the genetic code. So there's 16 blocks of codons. Each are defined by the first and second nucleotides within the block. For instance, this is the AC block that represents threonine, right? All Because all four of these code for threonine. Threonine is this guy right here. Some blocks are split into pyrimidine and purine halves, depending on the ending nucleotides. Certain amino acids have a full block of four codons, like alanine, threonine, the one we were just looking at, and proline. And then others have the pyrimidine or purine half of their block, like histidine and asparagine. Notice how histidine and asparagine have the last two codons are the same, but the first one is different. This is a C and this one's G. Some amino acids even have a block and a half, totaling six codons. An example of that would be serine, this guy here. He is encoded by these four codons, but also these two here. Again, you don't have to memorize this chart. This would be something that would be given as a resource if you needed it on an exam or a quiz. Oh, and I got to talk about this code on here, AUG. He has a dual role. It codes for an amino acid. It codes for methionine, but it also acts as the start codon to kick off translation. So AUG is the translation start codon. Somatic cells in our bodies each carry the complete set of the genome, the genetic information in their DNA, with a few exceptions like red blood cells and some immune system cells, which lack DNA in their mature state. One intriguing aspect of this is that not all genes are expressed in all cells simultaneously, right? So this is what's leading to the disparity that we observe in a cell or in the organ functions. Despite containing identical genes, different cells exhibit different characteristics. For instance, the cells in our eyes are different from the cells in our liver or in our stomach. And the reason behind this diversity lies in the process of regulation, which maintains the efficiency of cellular functions. Expressing all genes in every cell would be incredibly energy-consuming task, so cells wisely conserve energy by activating only the genes they need and only when they need them. This regulation also saves space within the cells, because if all the genes were expressed all at once, the cells would become massive. They'd be just like stuffed full of proteins. And by selectively expressing genes at different times, cells can respond quickly to changes in their environment or changes in what the body needs. This precise control ensures that essential proteins are synthesized promptly and precisely when they are needed and then stopped when they're no longer required. So regulation of gene expression during transcription dictates whether certain genes are either activated or repressed to determine which RNAs are produced. After transcription, there can be further regulation during the process of translation, influencing the rate at which proteins are synthesized. Moreover, even after a translation, there can be post-translational modifications that alter the structure or function of the proteins, and these modifications can affect how the proteins behave and where they localize within the cell. Figure 16.3 is again illustrating the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and how they regulate their gene expression. Uh, on the left, A is showing prokaryotic transcription and translation occurring simultaneously in the cytoplasm and regulation occurring primarily during transcription. And then side B, again, is showing eukaryotic gene expression regulation occurring during transcription, during RNA processing, during protein translation in the cytoplasm, and that there's further regulation happening through post-translational modifications of proteins as well. At the heart of cancer development lies disruptions in the normal cell cycle, leading to uncontrolled cell growth and division. These abnormalities can arise from various factors that result in the expression of genes not typically active in a particular cell type. The reasons for abnormal gene expression in cancer can, can be diverse and multifaceted. Gene mutations play a significant role where alterations in the DNA sequence can lead to the activation or inactivation of important genes involved in cell growth and regulation. Additionally, gene regulation, which controls the timing and extent of gene expression, can be disturbed, causing genes to be turned on or off at the wrong times. Epigenetic changes contribute to altered gene expression in cancer 
even though they don't involve alterations to the DNA sequence, but instead they affect how genes are packaged and regulated within the cell, and this leads to changes in gene activity. Phosphorylation of cyclin B can modify cell cycle progression, contributing to cancer development. Alterations in gene expression, including activation or silencing, play a central role. Epigenetic, transcriptional, post-transcriptional, translational, and post-translational mechanisms, they're all potential points of error. Understanding all of the diverse mechanisms that can lead to altered gene expression and can cause cancer helps to develop better treatments and even personalized treatments to combat the complex and heterogeneous group of diseases. Tumor suppressor genes play a role in helping to safeguard our cells from abnormal and uncontrolled growth. The primary function of a tumor suppressor gene is to prevent the occurrence of excess and or inappropriate cell proliferation, which, if left unchecked, could lead to the development of a tumor. One of the most well-known and critical tumor suppressor genes is P53. P53 acts as a transcription factor, so it regulates the expression of other genes involved in cell cycle control and DNA repair. When functioning correctly, P53 plays a crucial role in detecting damaged DNA and initiating processes that when functioning correctly, P53 detects damaged DNA and initiates processes that either halt cell division to allow for repair or trigger cell death if the damage is irreparable. However, the unfortunate reality is that P53 is susceptible to mutations. In fact, it's, it's estimated that over 50% of all cancer types involve mutations in the P53 gene. When mutated, P53 loses its ability to affect regulate cell growth and DNA repair, which paves the way for uncontrolled cell proliferation and the development of cancerous tumors. Proto-oncogenes are a group of genes that serve as positive regulators in the cell cycle, contributing to normal cell growth and division. However, when these genes undergo mutations, they can transform into oncogenes, which have the potential to cause cancer. The mutation in proto-oncogenes often lead to changes in their transcriptional activity, which disrupts the control of cell growth and division. A well-known example of a proto-oncogene is Mike or MYC, M-Y-C, a transcription factor that plays a role in regulating the expression of genes involved in cell growth. In certain types of cancer, like Burkitt's lymphoma, MYC becomes aberrantly activated due to the specific mutations leading to uncontrolled proliferation and tumor formation. And this figure here is showing uh, malignant B-site lymphocytes in a patient that has Burkitt's lymphoma. Here's a beautiful animation that helps to break down cancer cell proliferation and how certain treatments can work to stop it. We all start life as one single cell. Then that cell divides and we are two cells, then four, then eight. Cells form tissues, tissues form organs, organs form us. These cell divisions by which we go from a single cell to a hundred trillion cells are called growth. And growth seems like a simple thing because when we think of it, we typically think of someone getting taller, or later in life, wider. But to cells, growth isn't simple. Cell division is an intricate chemical dance that's part individual, part community driven. And in a neighborhood of a hundred trillion cells, sometimes things go wrong. Maybe an individual cell's set of instructions, or DNA, gets a typo, what we call a mutation. Most of the time, the cell senses mistakes and shuts itself down, or the system detects a troublemaker and eliminates it. But enough mutations can bypass these fail-safes, driving the cell to divide recklessly. That one rogue cell becomes two, then four, then eight. At every stage, the incorrect instructions are passed along to the cell's offspring. Weeks, months, or years after that one rogue cell transformed, you might see your doctor about a lump in your breast. Difficulty going to the bathroom could reveal a problem in your intestine, prostate, or bladder. Or a routine blood test might count too many white cells or elevated liver enzymes. Your doctor delivers the bad news. It's cancer. From here, your strategy will depend on where the cancer is and how far it's progressed. If the tumor is slow growing and in one place, surgery might be all you need, if anything. If the tumor is fast growing or invading nearby tissue, your doctor might recommend radiation or surgery followed by radiation. If the cancer has spread or if it's inherently everywhere like a leukemia, 
your doctor will most likely recommend chemotherapy, or a combination of radiation and chemo. Radiation and most forms of chemo work by physically shredding the cell's DNA or disrupting the copying machinery. But neither radiation nor chemotherapeutic drugs target only cancer cells. Radiation hits whatever you point it at, and your bloodstream carries chemotherapeutics all over your body. So what happens when different cells get hit? Let's look at a healthy liver cell, a healthy hair cell, and a cancerous cell. The healthy liver cell divides only when it's stressed. The healthy hair cell divides frequently, and the cancer cell divides even more frequently and recklessly. When you take a chemotherapeutic drug, it will hit all of these cells. And remember that the drugs work typically by disrupting cell division. So every time a cell divides, it opens itself up to attack. And that means that the more frequently a cell divides, the more likely the drug is to kill it. So remember that hair cell? It divides frequently and isn't a threat. And there are other frequently dividing cells in your body like skin cells, gut cells, and blood cells. So the list of unpleasant side effects of cancer treatment parallels these tissue types. Hair loss, skin rashes, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, weight loss, and pain. That makes sense because these are the cells that get hit the hardest. So in the end, it's all about growth. Cancer hijacks cells' natural division machinery and forces them to put the pedal to the metal, growing rapidly and recklessly. But using chemotherapeutic drugs, we take advantage of that aggressiveness, and we turn cancer's main strength into a weakness. The exploration of nucleic acids began with the identification of DNA and later expanded to the study of genes and DNA fragments. Eventually, this led to the field of genomics. Genomics involves the comprehensive examination of entire genomes, including all the genes, their nucleotide sequences, the way they're organized, the way they interact within the species and between species. And sequencing technology has, of course, significantly contributed to the advancements in genomics. Through DNA sequencing, scientists can decode the genetic information contained within the DNA of living organisms, and this gives insights into their characteristics and behaviors. Genomics has found diverse applications in anthropology and medicine, aiding in the understanding of human evolution and offering promising prospects for personalized medical treatments in the future. Biotechnology is the application of biological processes and organisms to develop technological solutions. Biotechnology has a rich history with early applications dating back centuries. However, it is in modern times that biotechnology finds primary applications in medicine, like vaccine and antibiotic production, as well as in agriculture, where genetic modification of crops is used to increase yields. And also biotechnologies used in industry for such applications as fermentation of cheeses, wines, oil spill treatments, and also biofuel, biofuel productions. DNA amplification is done by a PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And it's used to replicate a specific sequence of DNA, a target sequence. It involves using primers. Primers are short pieces of DNA that are complementary to the ends, the forward and the reverse ends of your target sequence. So they're, they're usually about 20 nucleotides in length, and it targets the five prime end of the forward, and then the same for the reverse. And the primers, along with genomic DNA, TAC polymerase, and deoxynucleotides, they're all put into a reaction mixture, and they're subjected to alternating hotter and colder temperatures which denatures and anneals the DNA strands that opens and closes them. The TAC polymerase is a special kind of DNA polymerase. It's the DNA polymerase that comes from a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. He's uh, thermophilic, lives in hot springs. So his DNA polymerase can tolerate really high temperatures, and high temperatures are used routinely in PCR. So that's why we use that. So during PCR, the mixture with all of the primers, genomic DNA, TAC polymerase, deoxynucleotides is subjected to temperature cycles, 
like I was saying. And that TAC polymerase is what adds the new nucleotides to the primers and helps to regulate the target DNA sequence. And it's repeated multiple times and it ends up with an exponential amplification of, of the target sequence. At the, we can also amplify fragments from an RNA template using what is called reverse transcriptase PCR. RT-PCR involves creating complementary DNA, cDNA template from RNA by incorporating DNA nucleotides nucleotides through a process called reverse transcription. An enzyme called reverse transcriptase facilitates this step. Once the cDNA is synthesized, the regular PCR can be used to amplify the new strand. RT-PCR is really useful for studying gene expression, viral infections, and RNA-based diseases. It allows uh, researchers to analyze RNA molecules similar to standard PCRs and analysis of DNA. Figure 17.5 is showing the PCR reactions. So you have primers, the little short pieces of complementary DNA. They bind with the genomic DNA using the TAC polymerase and the deoxynucleotides that you add to the reaction mixture. And then reverse transcriptase PCR, the RT-PCR, is very similar to PCR, but cDNA is made from an RNA template instead of a DNA template before the PCR begins. Hybridization is a molecular biology technique where two single-stranded DNA or RNA molecules with complementary sequences come together to form a stable double-stranded molecule. It's a fundamental process used in various applications like DNA and RNA detection, gene expression analysis, and identifying specific DNA or RNA sequences within a sample. Southern blotting is a lab technique that's used to detect specific DNA sequences in a sample. It involves several steps, including DNA digestion, gel electrophoresis, uh, transfer of the DNA to a gel, and then hybridization with a labeled DNA probe that's complementary to the target sequence. So southern blotting allows researchers to identify and analyze DNA fragments of interest. Um, northern blotting is similar similar to southern blotting, but it's used to detect specific RNA molecules. Northern blotting involves separating RNA molecules based on size, again using gel electrophoresis, then transferring the RNA to a solid support, usually a membrane, hybridizing the RNA with a labeled DNA or RNA probe that's complementary to the target RNA sequence. And um, northern blotting is commonly used to study gene expression and mRNA levels in biological samples. Figure 17.6 is giving an overview of southern blotting and how it's used to find DNA. So they separate the DNA fragments on a gel. They transfer that to a nylon membrane. They incubate it with a probe that's complementary to the sequence that they're looking for. And then northern blotting, similar to that, but they're looking at RNA instead of DNA. And then another technique that's similar to that is western blotting. Western blotting is using the exact same fundamental technique, but they are using them to detect proteins and antibodies. Plasmids occur naturally in bacteria. So, for example, E. coli. And plasmids have genes that confer advantageous traits like antibiotic resistance. Scientists have repurposed and engineered plasmids as vectors for molecular cloning and for large-scale production of reagents like insulin and human growth hormone. Their effectiveness is partly due to something called the multiple cloning site, MCS. The MCS is a short DNA sequence that contains multiple sites that are reorganized and cut by restriction endonucleases, which are are enzymes that identify a specific DNA sequence, such as those found in the MCS. When the restriction endonucleases cut the DNA, it creates this like two to four base overhang, and that's called the sticky end. And sticky ends can 
bind or anneal with a complementary strand of DNA. This unique property of plasmids and the precise splicing facilitated by specific endonucleases allow scientists to perform highly precise DNA manipulation. They can insert specific DNA sequences into the plasmids at the desired location using the sticky ends, create recombinant DNA molecules, and then use this for genetic engineering, gene cloning, um, and many other biotechnological applications. In genetic engineering is to insert a new gene into a loop of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. The molecular tool used to cut DNA is a restriction enzyme such as ECOR1. The enzyme has a precise shape that allows it to run along the groove of the double helix, scanning in the case of ECOR1 for the base letter sequence GAATTC. The enzyme then cuts the plasmid at this specific point, allowing a new piece of DNA to be inserted. When it cuts, ECOR1 leaves a sticky end. This helps the new gene to attach. The joins are then stitched together by another enzyme called DNA ligase. The genetically engineered bacteria is grown in a culture medium. Very quickly, large numbers of the bacteria can be produced, each with a copy of the inserted gene. The bacteria duly manufacture whatever protein the gene codes for, and so the desired product is made. Genetic diagnosis involves testing for suspected genetic defects before administering a treatment. So genetic testing helps to determine the genetic basis of diseases and guides treatment plans. Gene therapy in particular focuses on targeting specific diseases at the genetic level, which, which is giving doctors promising avenues for treatments. So for example, by analyzing the genetic makeup of specific types of cancer, doctors can identify unique traits and then tailor treatment options accordingly. These advanced Advancements in gene diagnosis and gene therapy have the potential to revolutionize medical practices, providing more precise and tailored approaches to combating diseases and improving patient outcomes. Figure 1712 is showing a cytogenetic map. Uh, the bands on a cytogenetic map represent different regions of the chromosome, each with specific characteristics. So the dark bands, also known as G bands, are rich in the DNA base pairs adenine and thymine. And this makes them more susceptible to the staining that's used. And they tend to be gene-poor regions of the chromosome, often associated with heterochromatin, a, a tightly packed form of DNA that's less accessible for gene expression. The light bands, they're also called R bands, and they're rich in the DNA base pairs guanine and cytosine. These bands are gene-rich regions of the chromosome, and they're associated with euchromatin, which is a less compact form of DNA. So that makes it more accessible for gene expression. The application of whole genome sequencing has revolutionized the field of medical sciences. This technique, whole genome sequencing, involves determining the complete DNA sequence of an organism's genome. Whole genome sequencing serves as a powerful tool for investigating the genetic basis of various diseases. And it allows scientists to analyze an individual's entire genome and identify potential disease-causing genetic variations. Various methods are employed, but all of them incorporate some variation of the original old-school chain termination or Sanger dideoxy sequencing method. A genome is all the genes plus some extra that make up an organism. Genes are made up of DNA, and DNA is made up of long paired strands of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Your genome is the code that your cells use to know how to behave. Cells interacting together make tissues. Tissues cooperating with each other make organs. Organs cooperating with each other make an organism, you. So. You are who you are in large part because of your genome. Knowing the sequence of the billions of letters that make up your genome is the goal of genome sequencing. A genome is both really, really big and very, very small. 
the individual letters of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, are only eight or ten atoms wide, and they're all packed together into a clump, like a ball of yarn. So, to get all that information out of that tiny space, scientists first have to break the long string of DNA down into smaller pieces. Each of these pieces is then separated in space and sequenced individually. But how? It's helpful to remember that DNA binds to other DNA if the sequences are the exact opposite of each other. A's bind to T's, and T's bind to A's. G's bind to C's, and C's to G's. If the A, T, G, C sequence of two pieces of DNA are exact opposites, they stick together. Because the genome pieces are so very small, we need some way to increase the signal we can detect from each of the individual letters. In the most common method, scientists use enzymes to make thousands of copies of each genome piece. So we now have thousands of replicas of each of the genome pieces, all with the same sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we have to read them all somehow. To do this, we need to make a batch of special letters each with a distinct color. A mixture of these special colored letters and enzymes are then added to the genome we're trying to read. At each spot on the genome, one of the special letters binds to its opposite letter. So we now have a double-stranded piece of DNA with a colorful spot at each letter. Scientists then take pictures of each snippet of genome. Seeing the order of the colors allows us to read the sequence. The sequences of each of these millions of pieces of DNA are stitched together using computer programs to create a complete sequence of the entire genome. This isn't the only way to read the letter sequences of pieces of DNA, but it's one of the most common. Of course, just reading the letters in the genome doesn't tell us much. It's kind of like looking through a book written in a language you don't speak. You can recognize all the letters, but still have no idea what's going on. So the next step is to decipher what the sequence means, how your genome and my genome are different. Interpreting the genes of the genome is the part scientists are still working on. While not every difference is consequential, the sum of these differences is responsible for differences in how we look, what we like, how we act, and even how likely we are to get sick or respond to specific medicines. DNA microarrays are scientific tools used to analyze gene expression by studying fixed DNA fragments on a glass slide or a silicone chip, silicon chip, and identifying active genes and sequences. Microarrays detect nearly a million genotypic abnormalities, while whole genome sequencing provides information about six billion base pairs in the human genome. While exploring medical applications of genome sequencing is fascinating, the field focuses on abnormal gene function, and understanding the entire genome can enable researchers to identify future onset diseases and genetic disorders early, leading to informed decisions about lifestyle and medication, family planning. Although genomics is still in its early stages, someday whole genome sequencing may become routine, like a routine screen in newborns that can detect genetic abnormalities. Genomics extends beyond disease and medicine contributes to advancements in biofuel production through novel enzymes, resulting in increased crop and fuel output, uh, reduced consumer costs. It can aid in better control of microbes using used in biofuel production. It can monitor methods for measuring pollutant impacts on ecosystems. It can help in environmental contamination cleanup. Genomics has facilitated the development of agrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, medical science, agriculture, proteomics, Uh, involves the comprehensive study of all the proteins expressed by a specific type of cell under certain environmental conditions. So it's a dynamic field that heavily relies on protein analysis and is frequently employed to investigate various types of cancer. Uh, Genomic and proteomic scale analysis fall under systems biology, which is the study of whole biological systems like genomes and proteomes based on interactions within the system. 
um, the European Bioinformatics Institute and the Human Proteome Organization work on effective tools for managing the vast amounts of system biology data. Proteins directly stem from genes and so they reflect genomic activity, making proteomes valuable for identifying proteins and genes involved in diseases. Proteomic data aids in identifying new drugs and understanding their mechanisms of action, especially since pharmaceutical drug trials target proteins. Despite challenges in detecting small protein quantities, mass spectrometry is useful for this purpose. However, discerning variations in protein expression during disease states can still be challenging due to protein's natural instability, making proteomic analysis more difficult than genomic analysis. What they do is they study the genomes and the proteomes in order to comprehend disease genetics. And there is a primary focus on cancer uh, because cancer, again, is not just one disease. It's a whole lot of different diseases with a whole lot of different mechanisms and pathways. And being able to use genomes and proteomes enhances cancer screening and early detection by identifying disease-related protein expression, biomarkers, and individual proteins and protein signatures with altered expression levels. Um, but the current challenge lies in the high rate of false and negative results, which is making biomarkers less reliable. Uh, protein biomarkers like CA125 for ovarian cancer and PSA for prostate cancer are used, but protein signatures may offer more reliability in detecting cancer cells. Um, proteomics is also used to develop personalized treatment plans, predict drug responses, and um, predict potential side effects. The National Cancer Institute programs such as Clinical Proteomic Technologies for Cancer and Early Detection Research Network aim to identify cancer-specific protein signatures and design effective therapies. This concludes the Lesson 7 material. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.